Hello. How's it going? Hey, we're back on our show. Wait. Were we off our show? <laughs> yeah, um, we were on some other show about, yes, music. It was some sort of podcast, but yeah, so... Yeah, again, thanks again to Kevin and to Mark. You know, that was a fun thing to collaborate on last week for April Fool's Day. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, when the four of us can, like, do something together uh, in the near future. Now yeah. I'm even more confused. There was an April Fool's show. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you caught that and joined the conversation in the comments? Steve's going to be monitoring the comments both on our Yes Shift page and the Drum Talk TV page. We figure since I'm the executive producer, host of Drum Talk TV, we just blast this out to both channels. But today is a young man's very special birthday. Steve Howe is 75 today. Wow. Yeah, for a moment, it sounded like you were asking me a question. You're like, Steve, how is 75 <laughs> today? And it's like, I don't know, does the number have feelings? But yeah, yeah, it's a very... <laughs> A huge birthday, yeah, like three, yeah, it's a huge, well, you know, 75 is just so symbolic, it's that uh, another quarter century, yeah. and yeah, what a career Steve Howe has had, and we figured since we're going through uh, Yes Member's first solo album since joining the band, it'd be fitting to talk about his first album, which happened to come out in 75, you know. Um, so this is titled Beginnings, uh, not to be confused with Trevor Rabin's first solo album, Beginnings. <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? What's with <laughs> these guys? They're always doing that, right? Yeah, uh, I think Trevor's was initially titled Beginnings, and then in a different region, it was just released as Trevor Rabin, but yeah. Um, and I guess we should give some context for the time period that yeah. this came out. 1975, coincidentally, Steve Howe was 75 years old. Today, as we're doing this April 8th, and it came out in 75, a great year for music releases by some really big bands. Yeah, so in terms of what Yes were up to, the previous year, they'd done Relayer, and this was also a huge turning point in Prague. You know, a bunch of them had been well-established and put out the stuff that's generally considered like the classics, you know, the big Epics. milestones, the, the canon, if you will. Yeah. Um, but then in 74, you also have ELP going on hiatus and King Crimson disbanding for a time. Um, and funny enough, I, I'm actually in the middle of reading Steve Howe's autobiography, All My Yesterdays, and I knew that Vangelis was considered for Yes!, uh, apparently, he even rehearsed with them, but he, uh, they had, like, different ideas. Like, he wasn't into, like, using the same musical idea more than once, and they wanted to play things the same way or whatever. But one thing I don't think I knew was that Steve Howe also called Keith Emerson and tried getting him to join the band at this time. Yeah, I read, I read if I could touch on that, not that long ago, an article that included Keith talking about that. It might have even been a video. And he was sort of insulted, but when he was explaining this, I think it was a video, he was explaining this, he didn't seem miffed, but his words were like, I already have a band. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, that's what he said. <laughs> and my name is on the band. Like, why would you ask me to, you know, because back then there wasn't all this cross-pollination with people like, Phil Collins playing with a ton of people, Mike Portnoy being in five bands and, you know, all that kind of thing. It was very, everyone was in their corner, basically. Yeah, and it was also funny because years earlier, Steve Howe had auditioned for The Nice, which was Emerson's band that he was in, and Atomic Rooster, which Carl Palmer was in. Right. Um, and uh, apparently uh, Jethro Tull was also, like, you know, they considered him, but he didn't like that. They said writing is not a requirement. You know, Steve wanted more input on the creative side, which is very understandable. Yeah, and it's um, also why I think Keith probably never would have worked out 
with Yes because he was just so much more of a dominant composer. I, I mean, I'm hypothesizing, obviously, but it working with five people is quite a bit different than three people when you have so many right. different ideas and everybody's a composer, a lyricist, and all that. So they put out Relayer, and then in 75... Um, so what's also going on, Rick Wakeman, you know, is up to King Arthur at this point. Yes, finish their North American tour in Jersey City, July 25th. And then they do a show in Reading in the UK on August 23rd. For the Relayer album, correct? Yeah. And around that time, Peter Gabriel's departure from Genesis is announced on August 15th. Wait a minute. Peter Gabriel's not in Genesis anymore? <laughs> I know, shocker. And Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here came out in September. You, you know, it's really bizarre, like, reading all this and, like, thinking about how, like, you know, recently Genesis finished their last Domino tour, a very clever tour title, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I, I read somewhere that apparently Peter Gabriel might have watched the show but not been on stage. And also Pink Floyd, like, just put out a song, you know, in light of recent events so it's just strange to give how all these musicians like still all these years later have still had this staying presence doing all these things well not just that but you know let's just elaborate on that a little bit with the genesis thing there were people miffed that peter gabriel and steve hackett weren't there like where the fuck have these people been for the last 30 (laughs) whatever years that those two guys have not had anything to do with the band then you move over to Pink Floyd, and I just read this morning, they put out this new single. It's like the first new music in 28 years or something like that to, to raise yeah. uh, money for what's going on in Ukraine, which is a beautiful thing. But then there's people saying, no Roger Waters, no Pink Floyd. And then there are people saying, there's no Sid Barrett. Like, first of all, Sid Barrett and Rick Wright are gone. And people are saying that because Roger, Sid, and Richard are not in the band anymore, They've been out of the band for collectively a hundred years for a hundred. It's like, where have these people been? Like I wore a Pink Floyd shirt shopping the other day. And this guy said to me, I remember Pink Floyd. And I'm thinking they're kind of still around, idiot. I mean, they're not putting out a bunch of new music right now, but they're still relevant. They, it doesn't seem like maybe that's not fair of me because it doesn't seem that long ago that they actually were doing stuff. But yeah, like they put out the Division Bell in the 90s and then they released Endless River in 2014, which they'd record in the 90s as a tribute to and Richard that's only Wright eight years ago. You know, yeah. this guy made it sound like he went out of style with Fred Flintstone's car or something. Yeah, like, a, like just... the musicians have been performing Pink Floyd music separately. Like, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's just... <laughs> Sorry about the tangent, yeah. but you... Brought that up and it reminded me of that story. And, you know, like, anyways, continue as you were. (laughs) Yeah, so all this stuff is going on in 75. And then we get uh, Steve Howe's Beginnings, which uh, apparently came out October 31st, 1975. Where, Um, Where do you know, Steve, off the top of your head, where that ranks chronologically of who put out solo albums first? once they put out a solo album after joining Yes? Yeah, so it's the third, you know, it's after Six Wives and Two Sides of Pure Banks. But in terms of the members at the time, like this was the first one that came out. Um, Fish Out of Water came out like a week later, it seems. That's interesting. Yeah, um, I'll just read a few comments real quick. Dylan Kim Park says, Blessed Birthday, Brian Cahoon says, Jens, smiley face, easy on nice. It it was an awesome time to be alive. And Tyler Anderson says, happy freaking birthday. So, yeah. Nice. Um, Thanks, guys. Yeah. So, yeah, beginnings. Um, Just looking at the doc we have here. So, uh, should we read off the names of the tracks on here? Or should I... Let's okay. let's read off the you read off the tracks and then I'll read off who played on it on the album. Okay, so there are nine tracks total. We've got Doors of Sleep, Australia, The Nature of the Sea, Lost Symphony, Beginnings, Will O Wisp, Ram, Pleasure Still the Night, and Break Away from It All. 
And sorry, I forgot to turn my email off, so it's chiming in once in a while. I apologize, folks. Just yeah, pretend pe- the muffins people, are ready. Yeah, people emailing uh, happy birthday wishes for Steve Howe. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the track list, and we'll talk about that album a lot. I'm going to look over here to my notes because I don't remember everybody uh, that played on it. And I won't give a track by track, but basically um, Steve Howe is on this. Um, on electric and acoustic guitars, bass, plays great bass, by the way. Bass, lap steel, mandolin, banjo, Moog, synthesizer, organ, washboard, and vocals. Uh, Graham Taylor, guitar, Malcolm Bennett, bass and flute, Colin Gibson, bass, Chris Lawrence, bass, and double strings, guitar. Patrick Moraz, who was also in the Nice, just kidding, plays uh, <laughs> piano, grand piano, harpsichord, and mellotron. Bud Beetle, alto and baritone saxophone, McEve, tenor saxophone, Patrick Halling, William Reed, both play violin, John Meek, viola, Peter Haling also plays cello, James Gregory, piccolo flute, Sidney Setcliffe, oboe, Gwyn Brook, bassoon. Those are two of my favorite reed instruments. I love oboe and bassoon. Alan White, who you may remember from Joe Cocker and John Lennon. Uh, I don't know where Steve dug him up. Plays drums <laughs> on four tracks. David Oberle plays drums and sounds like, well, I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> and Bill Bruford plays drums on a couple tracks and percussion on one that he also plays drums on. So David Oberly um, plays drums on, uh, let me look up the track name. Yeah, it's the third, third one. Track, which is yeah, the nature of the sea. I, it sounds not only just like Alan, but like he's playing on Alan's drums, which very well could have been the case. Um, I had to look up the credit because I thought, I don't remember if this is Alan playing on that, but it sounds like him. And then I looked it up and it was David Overly. So I thought I could just picture Steve showing his buddy, you know, yeah, so this is where we're recording the album. You know, in fact, uh, I have this idea. Do you feel like tracking some drums? Alan's kit is set up and it's mic'd. You know, it sounds that much like his drums <laughs> and he sounds a lot like his playing, which is really cool. Um, can I make a general comment about personnel on all these Yes Solo albums? Sure. I find it really interesting that Rick Wakeman, Steve Howe, Chris Squire, Alan, who am I forgetting? Maybe Patrick? Well, Patrick and Bill did that or the pro- But they have guests from Yes. And that makes it, to me, less of a solo album fast forward all these years later when we look at eh, that lineup's really no more removed from a less a yes lineup than the current lineup or the last three or four lineups for that matter so it's kind of interesting um that they didn't reach farther out like like really steve you couldn't get other drummers you know besides (laughs) alan and bill for all those songs and i i think it's cool that he used them but I find it interesting that I don't think that happens today. Maybe it does here and there, but, you know, you don't have um, Nick Mason playing drums on all of David Gilmore's solo stuff. You know, I I just find it weird. Don't you? Am I alone here? Hello, is this thing on? (laughs) I mean, it doesn't feel weird to me because, look, the music world is all about networking, right? So... If one is making a solo album and they want dependable people, then naturally they'll I, invite people they have a good rapport with. Yeah, but but if if it's a solo album and it's your own material, and then you're having guys, not girls in this case, guys coming from the band that you broke away from to do the solo project, and you got two or three guys from that band on your solo album, How did that song not work as a yes? I don't know. I I just expected long before right now, decades ago when I first got this and I looked at who's on it, I thought, huh? Oh, huh? Oh, Patrick Moraz too. Huh? (laughs) Same thing with Chris's album with Patrick and and Bill. I, I just find it interesting. 
Yeah, and Steve actually also wanted to invite another uh, bandmate, in this case, someone from one of his pre-Yes bands, Bodast. It was a guitarist and vocalist named Clive Skinner. And it says here in All My Yesterdays, you know, his autobiography, that he imagined Clive would sing all the vocals, but oh. for, for whatever reason, like they weren't able to get him and so steve decided to do all the vocals and um unfortunately clive passed away a few years after this but oh. it, it was something that uh, i guess steve thought would be a it would have been a nice idea to have clive do the vocals and um and uh, on that note I, I think that people are a bit too harsh on steve singing lead here like i'll admit that there are moments where I need to really listen to know what he's singing, like what the words are. Uh, otherwise, I'll need the lyrics in front of me. But I don't think he's a bad singer. I think he sings pretty well. You know, you hear the emotion in it, and that's what really matters. What I like about it is um, his voice fits the music perfectly. The opening track is a great opening track for the album, first of all. Um, but it's also like... Up to that point, if you listen to Yes Music since Steve joined the band, you're used to hearing that layer in the chorale of Yes Voices. Now we're hearing it extracted on its own, and it's quite interesting. His voice sounds as earthy and organic as the rest of the music on the album. So I, I never knew that fact. That's interesting. And I his voice, you either like it or you don't. There's no in-between. And a lot of people don't. I happen to like it. And listening to this album to brush up on it, because I haven't heard it in a very long time, really brought back some memories of when I first first heard it. Like, I thought I smelled weed in here for a moment. But, <laughs> but there's nothing like that going on here. And I have to be honest. I opened this up. The older folks will get this. And I, I looked in the crease to see if there were any remnants of anything, and there are not. But... <laughs> But but really, it brought back some really neat memories, and and I was very impressed with the musicality of it. There's a lot of really neat stuff on this album. If you're not familiar with it, it's worth getting for sure. It's a great album, I think. Yeah, it's been several years since the last time I listened to it, and so brushing up for it for this show, I was kind of surprised that it was more adventurous than... I remembered like Me too. Right, like right from the start, um, you, you know, Doors of Sleep, it sets the tone. Um, I'm not sure who the voices are at the beginning of that song. Oh, like I, I kind of think it's Dylan. OK, yeah, I thought it might be him as right. well, but I, could, I couldn't was find a little anything. boy. Right. He would have been you're not familiar. Yeah, he would have been like six at this time. So possibly. Yeah. Um, Australia feels like. Bits of it remind me of Mood for a Day. I don't know if you felt that way yes. as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, the nature of the sea is very, it has lots of different twists and turns. Like it'll be like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and then like later on, I'll suddenly feel like I'm in Italy listening to like more calm, relaxing yeah. music. Like it takes you in very different places. I um, love the guitar solo in, uh, Australia. It's very quirky and animated. I love that. Um, also, the song, uh, is it Beginnings or, no, Willow Wisp? That starts out, it sounds like the very beginning of Roundabout. Yeah, first, that, that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love, at first, I had to look at the laptop to see if maybe it changed to uh, some other playlist or something. Right, yeah, it was, you know, it's just like when we heard that part on that one song on Peter Banks' is slow up, but we we're like, wait, it sounds kind of like Roundabout. Yeah. Like, it just keeps coming back, I guess. We can't escape it. That's funny. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I feel like, um, you know, Lost Symphony is really good as well, but yeah. I, f I feel like Beginnings sounds more symphonic to my ears. Like, yeah, like, it more technically is, yeah. Yeah, um, and Steve does compliment uh, Patrick in his book on how, like, 
the work that he did for beginnings and stuff. Um, and Ram, of course, you know, it's very, that's probably the one that's most familiar to me. Like that and beginnings, I remember from the yes years video and they have pleasure as stole the night. It's pretty good. Um, break away from it all. It's good, but I kind of feel like it's kind of an abrupt end to the album. I don't know if yeah, that's just me, though. I, I agree. What would you have chosen to be uh, the last song, if you could change that? <laughs> I know you were going to ask me that. Um, uh, I feel like maybe either The Nature of the Sea or Lost Symphony... I was going to say Nature of the Sea or Will o' the Wisp. Um, mm. Pleasure Stole the Night would be cool, but it's too short. That, again, would be abrupt in a different way because it's just so so short. But but the set list is good the way it is. Do you know why Ram is called Ram, Steve? I'm not really sure. So his birthday's today. Right. My birthday was this past Saturday, April 2nd. What do we have in common? Uh, April birthdays. Right. And we share the same astrological sign, which is Aries. Oh, is the ram connected to that? Yes. Or? Yep. The ram is the sign of the Aries. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I'm not sure if that was intentional or not. Cause it, you know, I've heard that. Uh, I'm not sure if he's really into astrology, but I, I don't know, think maybe. He, I'm not, but I know that the ram is, do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm okay. guessing that had something to do with it. Right, yeah. I mean, it'd be weird if it was called Aquarius or <laughs> Virgo, right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so um, do you have a, a couple favorite tracks you want to point out? I think you kind of did, right? Yeah, my, my favorite out of all of them is probably Nature of the Sea because, again, it takes very different turns, so it ha feels like it has a lot packed into it. Yeah. For me, it's that and... God, I love Doors of Sleep and Australia. So either one of those would be my my second. But right. I, I love Beginnings. I love the orchestration. And back when this came it's out. It's a very beautiful song, yeah. It is. And, and when this came out, I was heavily into Baroque music and, and classical music, Brahms and Tchaikovsky, all that stuff. And I played in orchestra in school. And so I loved that. It was great. And like I said, I love oboe. I love bassoon. Yeah. And um because they look like a bong. I mean a water <laughs> pipe. No, I'm kidding, that's not why. I, I really love those instruments. Right. So I'll read a few more comments. Yeah, um please. yeah. Mark Cole says, Who wouldn't invite Bill and Patrick? <laughs> well, that's a great point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh Brian Cahoon says seeds and dust. Uh, I'm not sure what that's in reference to. Maybe it's when you opened the album or something. No, I don't that know. that's um that's on the um the the re-release has a couple extra tracks, and that's one that Francis Monkman plays on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah Michael, Brian, tell us what that is. Yeah, Michael Morganlander says happy birthday. Lori Simone says, happy birthday, Steve. Hope to see him out soon. Seeing yes 13 times. I need to make another show to make it 14 a charm. Nice. Um, yeah, and Brian says, not how your early? normal. Wait, I'm sorry. How TV. early? Tell us the first show you saw. And everybody right, yeah. could chime in on that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Steve. And Brian Cahoon mentioned a water bassoon and Benny Herbert's, or sorry, Benny Herbst says, happy birthday. <laughs> Water bassoon. You know what he's referencing, right? Um, My bong comment. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I have a couple highlights I want to read from what Steve says about the album and his autobiography. Okay. And while um, you do that, I'm having a little medical thing I need to take care of. Oh, okay. Because of my yeah. diabetes. So go ahead. Folks, I'm going to leave you with Stephen, who's the producer of the show and the host. I'm just the, well, I'm not even the arm candy. I'm the, br no, I'm not the brains. Why am I here again? Well, I'll be back. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah. So here, Steve has this short chapter where he talks about beginnings and 
it's kind of surprising that's short, but maybe not because he has such a long career and has to fit all of it into this book. But yeah, I'm almost halfway through this book. Maybe I'll finish it later today. Uh, but yeah, um, I got up to the drama and disbanding portion of it. But anyway, in this uh, chapter on beginnings, it's chapter nine. And so what Steve says is... Um, Oh, here it is. Uh, so he says, Many of the tracks began by recording a decent rhythm guitar live with Alan White or Bill Bruford on drums, when we'd play through the whole arrangement. Conversely, Lost Symphony was played live in the studio with everyone, as was Beginnings and The Nature of the Sea. Ram was built up from a click track and featured my first banjo part. Actually, it was a banjo guitar stroke strung tuned and played the same as a guitar so yeah that's a bit about the making of it and he says that i have to say that patrick moraz performed miracles in orchestrating beginnings and playing harpsichord on the album's title track he also conducted the orchestra and played some great keyboards on other tracks too notably the mellotron on will-o-wisp one of three tracks to have lyrics written by my wife jan um and uh Okay, so you're back. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I'm diabetic, folks, and sometimes stuff just comes up unexpectedly. I had to take care of. Sorry. Right, but start you're over, just start over. What did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're just in time for the um, Eddie offered a uh, story that oh, is in yeah. here. So, um, uh, he Steve says later on, I produce all my own solo albums, but since Eddie was on board to co-produce and engineer. I tried to make the best of the collaboration. An element of fun came with working with him. One afternoon, he burst into the downstairs studio and did a cartwheel across the room, <laughs> dropped into a chair, opened his bag, and produced a bottle of whiskey and a duck call. He took a swig from the bottle, blew the duck call, and just said hello. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. Yeah, I can Brian, picture that, right? <laughs> yeah, Brian Cahoon says the water bassoon again. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta and, try that on a drum talk TV tomorrow when I do my live. I'm gonna try that. Jeez, I, I just gotta run out and get the whiskey. <laughs> uh, Kat, Kathy Amber Ammerling says, "Happy birthday! My birthday is Sunday." Yeah, yeah happy birthday! Happy to you, birthday! Kathy. Yeah. Uh, so, do you want to talk about the promo video? Which yeah. Includes the songs Ram, Break Away From It All, and Beginnings. Yes, and the only uh, reason we're not going to show that is because it has the official tracks and then the, it'll get muted and right. all of that. But um, the when they show, when Ram, when the video for Ram, when I first saw that, like I knew the music audio-wise, but in the video, and we'll explain the video, but... It just kept coming like there's another Steve and yet another. What else? Oh, yeah, that instrument, too. Um, and it's great because it starts out with Steve playing guitar. And then they add another Steve up here when the other instrument comes in. And then the banjo, then the this, then the that, then the washboard. And it's a bunch of Steves. And it's done really well, especially uh, given the time, 1975. It's pretty cool. I love that. Yeah, it's it, like this is the real Steve Howe band. Like I know people say like, you know, yes, it's just a Steve Howe band, but no, they're wrong. This with literally five different Steve <laughs> yeah. Howes is a Steve Howe band. And Steve, what's the, what's the clip in there in that promo that shows that crowd of people right away. I thought of the end of owner of a lonely heart. Yes. Video, right. Yeah. That was break away from it all. Yeah. I had that thought too. When Steve is in the crowd, it's like, wow, this is just like the beginning and end of the owner of a lonely heart video with the guy. A did they plan that owner of the, the 90125? Yes. Do you think, did anyone say, Hey, didn't Steve, maybe we shouldn't, or did they say, Hey, let's do that thing. Uh, like, what do you think went down with that? It was probably a coincidence, but it, it'd be really funny or, or maybe not. Maybe if they'd asked uh, Steve house. So like, uh, we have a guitarist, but do you want to be the guy in the owner of Lonely Heart Music video yeah. who like <laughs> goes through all this weird shit? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Steve, by the way, is Captain Coincidence. Like, it's a coincidence that Ram is named Ram. It's a coincidence. That, it's a coincidence also that Steve Howe wrote his own autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Breakaway from it all has like the most uh, 
location stuff. Like there's a farm, but there's also like some visual effects, like these lights and it's like kind of trippy. You can look um, it up on YouTube. Steve will put it in the comments actually. It's really cool. Yeah. And um, I'll, yeah, I'll search for it now, but yeah. And for the song beginnings, you know, it's Steve and Patrick in a room, there are candles and it looks really nice. And, yeah. I remember uh, that. Yeah. And j just the footage like looks very crisp the way they've, uh, they have it like this was um, bits of it were featured on the old gray whistle test back in 75. And then uh, the full thing was put in the yes songs DVD or Blu-ray or whatever it was. And They're I remember like, seeing it on MTV back when MTV played music. Oh, really? Yeah. And Patrick's playing harpsichord. Yeah. And he, and they also played Ram on MTV, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Yeah. I would love to, um, what's the song? Oh, well, for that matter, I'd love to see a video of Doors of Sleep. Not a storytelling video, but a video of them playing it, I think would be great. I just, I really like that song. Yeah, and Steve's brother, Philip, worked on, like, some of this. You know, he's... He, he's done film and television yeah. and stuff. So, yeah, really cool. Um, yeah, I, so I posted the link to that in the comments. And yeah. you want to talk about the cover? Yeah, so the cover is by some obscure person named Roger Dean. <laughs> uh, not sure where he dug him up. Um, he, he, he actually has a comment uh, in his uh, biography. It says, Roger Dean created a lovely sleeve combining a photo of me and my guitars. Um, I took an early selfie of Jan, Dylan, and myself, which was superimposed in the foreground of another photo I took of a Devon Hedgerow. This stretches across the central gatefold sleeve. Um, so yeah, it's... It, and up until Tony K released his solo album last year, this was the only one of those like first soul album since joining yes that had roger dean art on it you know we've right. talked about how elias of sun hill almost got roger dean but yeah for a while this was like the only one also he's done work for rick wakeman but that yeah. doesn't count because we're talking about first solo albums since joining yes ah you mentioned elias of sun hill just real quick that reminded me of when i was talking about using the members from the band, if I remember right, there's no one from Yes on Elias of Sun Halo, correct? Right, yeah. Yeah, John just went completely the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, yeah. you know, that's what I would expect. But th I love this. This is, when this came out, it might have been my favorite Roger Dean cover, actually. I'm oh, thinking, wow. Yeah. I'm thinking, like, Yes songs... Yes, songs almost doesn't count because there's like eight covers in that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's more than a gatefold. What would you call that? It's like the front gate, the back gate, and the side gate. Yeah, the um, gates of delirium, so to speak. Yeah, and I, I do love the relayer cover, but I really like this. It's a perfect example of how Roger was doing a lot of work back then. If you get his uh, book Views, he was blending um organic with architecture and this is a perfect example of that and i love that uh steve is in there i forgot what this instrument here is called but if i remember right that's called a valchalia okay and it's got strings so it's got like a regular guitar neck and extra strings there then the less whoops less paul martin es175 i forgot what this thing's called it's uh, mm. like square with the pointed like bat ears where the cutaways would be. I don't remember. If someone knows or just wants to make up a fucking name, go ahead and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we won't know the difference. <laughs> yeah, what do you think it, of the cover? How does it rank for you? It's a nice cover, but it might not rank as highly as others for me. Really? And Well, up um, to that point, though, because I'm judging like up to that point. It's It's my first or second favorite. Okay, um, it's definitely better than the Close to the Edge front cover. Um, but Close to the Edge is a whole different thing. There's a surprise, yeah, which yeah, I love. Yeah, I know, but it's the joke, the, the green. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, and it's actually not <laughs> the inside of the gatefold of that. It does really not have a lot of detail, but there's the whole song right there in that 
Except for in who white lays. Except for that part, the whole song is in the gatefold. Um, right. And uh, fragile, as iconic as that is, kind of looks archaic compared to everything that came after it, I think. Yeah, I can see that because it's not as close up and detailed. Um, but while we're on it, I'll just bring up real quick. So Roger Dean uh, in his live painting sessions, apparently the one he's working on right now is like within the same area as the close to the edge painting, like that same world. And he says mm -hmm. he mentioned something about a box set um, in late, like late this year. So may, so probably uh, yes. 50th anniversary box. Yeah. Like okay. close to the edge. Yeah. Cause that's right. Cause you asked him right during the live, if that was. Um, no, someone related. else asked him, but I asked him about the drama cover and whether, oh, you know, the birds and the cats. Yeah, because we've been reading Yes in the 1980s, and uh, there's a speculation of whether the Panthers and the Birds represent the band members. And when uh, that question was read to him, he said, there has been speculation, and then uh, he just decided he's going to leave people hanging. So, Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cheeky. So I don't know if that confirms it or if he's just having fun, loves to leave people hanging, you know, yeah. sense of humor. But anyway, um, as for this cover, I guess I do like it more than the Fragile cover. Um, I do. So with Relayer, all the gray works really well for that, the tone of that album. But I yeah. do like more colors. So I guess this does have a little bit more of an edge on that. But I'm talking in terms of the actual illustrations so like the weird thing for me is that i i kind of don't like that it mixes the roger dean illustration with a photo of a person um like you, it kind of you mean on the gate oh oh you mean on the front that, yeah on the front yeah really you know, Steve i think Howe. that's neat well like i get that it's to show like whose album this to, is to but me it, it brings all this to life but but go on but I guess maybe I'm just weird. It's kind of like me with um, kind of what I think about puppet movies is I feel like puppet movies would be more immersive if there are no like live action humans. Like if there are live action humans, you know, it could still be a good movie or show or whatever. But I feel like it kind of what's an example so so people can understand what you're talking about. Um. Well, I guess David Bowie works fine for Labyrinth, but with The Dark Crystal, I really love how there are no live action humans oh, gotcha. at all. Like I, I have a friend who felt the opposite, like thought it was creepy that there were no humans at all. But for me, it just immerses me in yeah. that world. Um, I agree. So, so I see what you mean. It kind of, it's almost like breaking the fifth wall or something, right? Like, <laughs> like bringing two yeah. dimensions or worlds together. Right, yeah, but it, it's not a bad cover. I like it. It's just you know, it's the weird thing of like the mixed media aspect of it. I guess mm -hmm. like it's not what I'm used to. Right, cool. Um, how might working with Yes have influenced this album? Do you think? Now we know Steve, of course, influenced Yes, but we always like to sort of ponder this question when it's someone's first solo album after they've been working with Yes. How much did working with Yes influence the album? And what, what are your thoughts on that? Right. We've touched on the people he got on the album who, you know, he knows from Yes. Um, yeah, I, I feel like with this album, it might be another case of like, you know, there are some instances where it feels very proggy. Uh, you know, the different changes in directions. And that's very much stuff he experimented with within Yes. But there are also parts that feel very outside of Yes, like not typically what I would think of when much it comes to... Much more folksy and the symphonic stuff. Yeah, so the members at the time, they wanted a break between touring, which gave them a chance to each try something sort of different, you know, get certain things out of their system and so i guess that motivation was kind of behind that you know he's with yes for five years at this point mm -hmm. and prior to this he did a 
like a show with a guitarist named John Williams, not that John Williams, not the movie guy, but a guitarist named John Williams. And he thought it was cool. So I guess maybe that um, was sort of the impetus for like, maybe I could make a solo album. And of course he's had a huge solo career in the decades yeah. since then. Has he made the most albums since being in Yes or has Rick? Uh, definitely Rick. Okay. But Steve's got to be close. He's got so many albums. Right. Yeah. Some I haven't even heard yet. I didn't hear that tribute to Bob Dylan. I haven't heard Homebrew. Um, there's a few others I just haven't heard. Yeah, the Homebrew albums are full of, they're basically like demos from different periods of his oh. career. Um, and Anthology has some of that too as well. But yeah, after this album, uh, he would go on to make the Steve Howe album in the late 70s. Um, I guess a reference to the Yes album, you know, that weird name. Um, and then it it would be like another decade before he made another solo album, which is Turbulence, uh, featuring um, a, bits that would end up on the Union album. And then after that, it's kind of more consistent, like when he would put out a solo album. Right. Um, and yeah, like there's, like, again, I'm surprised that the chapter on beginnings is short in his autobiography. And uh, but he's had such a long career, so I guess it makes sense that he would try to truncate it somehow. And but it does seem odd being that this is his first solo album ever, that right. he would make that so short. And I Yeah, and, and like I was reading Bill Bruford's uh, autobiography before getting to this one and thinking to myself, I kind of wish he'd go into what it was like working on these Yes Members solo albums, but... I guess in the grand scheme of things, uh, not the Steve Howe album, the grand scheme of things, um, like a <laughs> big, big picture is probably not that important for Bill to mention it. And then I was like, oh, duh, of course, Steve Howe would mention it and would talk more about the album and his bio about his own album. So, yeah. Well, guess um, what? Chicken butt. <laughs> Fried in grease. <laughs> Want a piece? No, but go on. Uh, we're having Bill on our show. April 13th. So, Steve, you can ask him about that. Yeah. Yeah. Bill yeah, I suppose I could. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Bruford's going to be on both our channels, Yes Shift and Drum Talk TV, simultaneously, April 13th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m., 2 p.m. Eastern, and that's 7 p.m. UK time. And we're going to be advertising the heck out of it. We've got a bunch of posts already scheduled on the Drum Talk TV Facebook page. Steve will program the same ones on Yes Shift. But we're going to have Bill on live and we'll relay some questions. No dumb questions, please. It's Bill <laughs> Bruford, okay? It's Bill Bruford. Right. So I don't know if you answered um, your side of the question of how Yes might have influenced oh, it. Um, I, I didn't. Um, so... I think, I believe one of the biggest ways is that's where Steve, I think, really cut his vocal chops as a harmonizer within Yes, you know, between John and Chris. So that's definitely there. And like I said earlier, to hear that kind of extracted on on its own is really interesting to me. Um, and I hear, I hear reminiscence of certain sounds that he's using um, like, forgive me, I can't remember the exact titles, but there's one song where he's doing some high-end guitar stuff and it's clearly, I believe, going through a Leslie Doppler speaker or it just has a quick vibrato on it. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff on the slide and the lap steel where, oh, that's that sound from NU and I. It's like the same sound and the end of... Um, uh, soon and stuff like that like there's these flashes of sounds from yes but then of course of of course he brought them to yes but does that make sense i know it's a chicken or the egg thing but not really because <laughs> he was in yes first but i'm i'm sure it probably influenced him on songwriting structure and things like that because for all we know he didn't do a lot of that uh before yes with the other bands with tomorrow and Bodas. I, I don't know. I'm just kind of guessing that even if he had that, 
having that role with yes had something to do with it and also like, having worked like with more Eddie freedom Alford, yeah yeah and having worked with Eddie offered and learning more about production and stuff too right yeah uh johnny Vallez or Vallez, that's two L's, uh, yeah. says peace, love, and chicken grease. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so how yes would you say this album is? Not a lot, actually, having said what I just said. I think <laughs> I think only 12.3 percent. <laughs> I I think it's mostly even though Alan's on it, even though Bill is on it, I think it's very and Patrick. And Patrick, of course. It's very Steve Howe. Um and it's not like Patrick playing exactly how he did in Yes or on Chris Squire's album, Fish Out of Water. So I, I don't hear nearly as much yes as um maybe on a couple other things like couple of rick's albums or something yeah maybe i'd go like 25 oh, percent really? at best that much twice as yeah. much yeah i think so um like again there are just some moments that feel adventurous in the way that yes is but there are other moments that feel adventurous in the way that only steve howe could do if that makes sense yeah and a big thing that sets it apart is steve singing lead vocals because we hadn't heard that right, yeah. with Yes up to that point. Yeah. Like, if this were instrumental, do you think that would have made it sound closer to Yes or oh, less wow. like Yes? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine. I'm thinking some of the music through. No, I still feel that it has a very earthy, folksy element to it that we only catch right. glimpses of with Yes. You know, that break in and you and I, that's totally Steve Howe, you know? Yeah. The whole well, with first half of my favorite Yes song, All Good People, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that. Um, Wondrous Stories is heavy Steve, in my opinion. Turn of the Century is heavy Steve. And I hear those elements in these songs. Like you can really feel his input on stuff that came later as well, having heard this. And a lot of it, I like I said, the best way to describe it for me is that earthy, folksy element. And, you know, he was really into um, American Western music as well. And he was into Wes Montgomery and jazz and stuff so a lot of these different things come through i mean he plays washboard and banjo in a song you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> the only other extremely popular rock guitarist i've known to do that sans washboard is jimmy page playing banjo on gallows pole and those are my two favorite guitarists steve and jimmy page so it's interesting you know those are two guys other than maybe paul mccartney who could pretty much pick up any stringed instrument and play it you know, without, right. yeah. So that that's my take. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely moments on the album where I can't really imagine what John and Chris might have sung on it. Like, it feels separate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, let's, let's play a bit of a video, and this okay. will be a little clunky, folks, for me to um, mix into the, the video because... And I'm looking over to where I'm going to, I need to drag it over. Uh, so bear with me. And here we go. This is Steve Howe. Um, and you can, I'm going to play an excerpt of it. You can check the whole thing out. This is from October 29th, 2007 from a YouTube channel. I'm going to spell it. It's D O K I D O K one word doc -a doc maybe. But let's uh, let's put this up. I'm just gonna drag it up here. You're you're gonna see some commercial stuff in the way, but uh, let's try this. There we go. All right, here's Steve Howe. This is really cool. Check this out, folks. Let's go start in a moment. It's refreshing. 
bear with us. Someone that knows what they're doing will be right with you. <laughs> wow, why is it freezing now? <laughs> Goodness. Okay, I'm going to refresh it. Yeah, in the meantime, um, regarding his autobiography, I think it would be funny if he <coughs> releases another one called All My Tomorrows. So, like, instead of All My Yesterdays, it'd be, like, his time in the band Tomorrow before he was in Yes. Right. Sorry about the stupid ads, folks. Here we go. Think about... Uh... Goodness, this is clunky. Sorry, it's going to play in just a moment here, I promise. <laughs> you know what, Steve? Why don't you just drop the link in there? Okay, yeah. Sorry, folks. All that, right. was, that was not cool. <laughs> right, but... Yeah, it's a pretty good read so far. It actually begins with the, you know, Steve recounting the awkwardness of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. Oh, really? Can you cite some of that, please? Uh, yeah, well, he basically talks about how both camps, you know, Yes and ARW were trying to interact with each other the least amount as possible and, you know, how... Steve also mentions the speeches weren't handled very well, you know, because of what happened with Rick. And, you know, we, we've had mixed feelings about how that went down. It could have been handled much better, yeah. Um, despite the performances being pretty good. Um, but, yeah, he, he talks about how he really wanted to put, pay tribute to Chris by playing on Nerval Only Heart the way he put it on the track. Um, so yeah, I guess he began, and that was actually five years ago yesterday, weirdly enough. That's right. Yeah. Co another coincidence. Yeah, it's bizarre, like, how quickly time passed. Um, and yeah, and also, like, the weekend of your birthday, like, either the first or the second marked, like, 10 years that John Davison was in the band. Really? So, yeah. Wow. It's, crazy how fast Ten years. time passes he's been in the band for about a fifth of their lifespan wow yeah um, Man, er that's wild where does time go <laughs> yeah earlier i shared on their facebook page a video of them playing leaves of green a few years back so nice. yeah, it's i would like to know who decided to invite getty lee for that i've never heard that was that steve's idea was it do you have any idea I'm not sure whose idea it was. I always assumed that like the people in charge at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame probably thought Rush are yes fans. Let's get Getty and Alex or something. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if this is something that the musicians lobby for. Like, oh, if you ever get these people inducted, I want to do speech for them. But I mean, whatever. Getty playing with them. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not really mentioned, but... um. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing, like, I don't know whose idea it was to get Getty specifically, but, you know, it's just one of those things where, like, people, like, I, I don't know if I really want to get into this, you know, the whole okay. thing of who should have been playing bass or whatever, but, you know. Oh, well, who else should have been? Billy? Oh, well, I mean, Billy seems like the obvious choice, but, yeah. Yeah. We know but that Getty anyway. and Alex are huge Yes fans. They were huge influences on on Rush. And Jimmy Page and Steve Howe were Alex's biggest influences. They're there. They happen to be there. Maybe. Who, who knows? I don't know. Yeah. But in, in any case, like their speeches, like of Getty and Alex were pretty good. Yeah. Um, so do you have like anything else to say about beginnings before we sort of close off? It was very refreshing to listen to it again. Um, I'm going to keep it up on my laptop and play it over the next few days. I encourage everybody to get it. Don't just listen to it on YouTube. Get it. Get the. It might be back out on vinyl or you can find the vinyl uh, or get the CD. It's really a great album. I'm wondering if the newer cd might have additional tracks we don't know about 
Yeah, I don't think it does. But but again, like Steve has a lot of demos and stuff on, you know, homebrew and anthology that it probably has like bonus stuff for that time period. Yeah, I would imagine. It's a, it really is a great album all around. Yeah. If you're a Steve Howe fan, I mean, if you're into Slayer and Metallica, I don't know. I don't know if you'll <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah, Tr- Trevor Rapin's beginnings might be more your speed if you're into that. <laughs> oh, God. Well, folks, thanks for following what we do. Um, not only Bill Bruford on the 13th, but is it the 21st, Steve? We're having the two authors of Yes in the 80s. Yeah, Stephen Lamb and contributor David Watkinson. Uh, yeah, we're going to have them on on the 21st. And maybe in between, we'll even review Bill's autobiography and as well as a review of Yes. He wrote it himself. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Thanks, everybody, so much for following what we do. You can uh, follow us. Now we're blasting these out to both channels, Drum Talk TV and Yes Shift, the mothership for this podcast video vlog on Yes Shift on Facebook, or if you're into podcasts, just the audio version, explore our 50 whatever episodes. Even though this is episode <laughs> 37, we have news desk reports archived as well. If you're into audio only, it's anchor.fm slash Yes Shift. And I guess you can write us too, if it's yeah. about Yes Shift. <laughs> yeah, y- you can email us at Yes Shift podcast at gmail.com and uh and yeah it's good, a very good time like we love talking about yes and all this stuff tendentially related to yes yeah let us know if you have suggestions for episodes if you want to comment on something you heard um we've been corrected before uh but anything drum talk tv related if you're seeing this on drum talk tv go to drum and on the upper right there's a few different choices depending on what you want to uh send in so thanks everybody so much and uh yeah keep their wonderful music alive